Did you know that the production, possession, and distribution of child pornography has been legalized in Australia? It hasn't been legalized for adults. It has, however, been legalized for anyone under the age of 18 years. At least it has in the state of Victoria. And other states appear to be following Victoria's lead. Furthermore, your children are being made fully aware by some sex education teachers that they do, in fact, have this legal right to create their own pornographic photos and videos and distribute these images to other children. Hi everyone, this is Vanessa Hamilton from Talking the Talk Sex and Health Education. Uh, they have the right to take images of themselves if they want to. They have the right to send um, images uh, that are sexually explicit. Rather than listen to the politicians tell us what their supposed intentions were, let's first look at what they actually did. In October 2014, the Victorian Parliament passed the Crimes Amendment Sexual Offences and Other Matters Bill 2014, which I have here on screen. This piece of legislation amended the Crimes Act and the Classification, Publications, Films and Computer Games Enforcement Act in order to, quote, provide for exceptions to child pornography offences, unquote. If I scroll down to the relevant section on page 17, you can see the specific amendment. After section 70 of the Crimes Act 1958, insert section 70 AAA, exceptions to child pornography offences. Section 68, 69 and 70 do not apply to a minor, a, if. Now, if we switch over to the contents of the amended Crimes Act itself, we can see what section 68, 69 and 70 are. Section 68 makes production of child porn illegal. Section 69 makes procurement of a minor for child pornography illegal. Section 70 makes possession of child pornography illegal. And you can see the new section 70 AAA there, providing for exceptions to child pornography offences. I'll scroll down to that section. As you can see, subsections 1 and 2 provide for exceptions if the images a child produces or possesses include themselves, either alone or with other children. But if we go to subsection 4, we see the full extent of the exceptions and how they actually legalize the possibility of a widespread economy of child porn amongst children. Subsection 4 legalizes the procurement, production, and possession of child porn by a child who is not themselves depicted in the image, as long as the youngest child in the image is no more than two years younger and the image depicts a legal sexual act. It should be noted that in the state of Victoria, sexual intercourse is legal for children as young as 12, as long as the partner or partners are no more than two years older and there is, quote, consent. Apparently 12-year-olds are capable of consent now. This means that a child pornography video depicting, for example, a group of 12-year-olds engaging in, quote, consensual sexual intercourse is legal to possess for any child up to the age of 14. Indeed, it would even be legal for a 14-year-old to procure children for and film such a video. Furthermore, if the video instead depicted 10-year-olds, that would also be legal for the 14-year-old if the 14-year-old can demonstrate that they believed the video depicted 12-year-olds. That's because subsection 4 provides exemptions for child pornography containing illegal acts if the child possessing the pornography, quote, believes on reasonable grounds that the acts were legal and believes on reasonable grounds that the children depicted were no more than two years younger than themselves. Similar amendments were made to the Classification, Publications, Films and Computer Games Enforcement Act to cover distribution and publication, which were not covered in the Crimes Act at that point. So spreading the images has also been made legal in the same way. I should also note that they've now moved the distribution and publication offences into the Crimes Act and reorganised the Crimes Act such, such that the child pornography offences and exceptions 
have been moved to Section 51. So if you look up the latest version of the Crimes Act, you'll have to go to Section 51 rather than Sections 68 to 70 to find the offences and exceptions related to child pornography. Now, you might ask why none of this was in the news back in 2014. Well, there was an elaborate deception which dressed up the changes as an innocent measure to protect underage teen couples from being convicted of child pornography offences and placed on the sex offenders register for merely sending scantily clad or nude photos and videos to each other on their smartphones, a practice they call sexting. When politicians want to introduce legislation they know the public won't support, they have a suite of deception tactics that they can use. For example, the perception of a crisis and the perception of public outrage can be artificially contrived with the help of allies in the media and elsewhere. The politician can then pursue their desired agenda claiming they are merely responding to the public's concerns. In this case, media beat-ups were used to justify an inquiry on sexting by the Parliament's Law Reform Committee in 2011. A report was produced by the Law Reform Committee in 2013, which of course told the government what it wanted to hear, despite receiving evidence from Victoria Police and others that made it blatantly obvious that there was no problem. For example, Victoria Police told the committee that as of 2012, there were no juveniles listed on the sex offenders register for sexting. Zero. Victoria Police also told the committee that, quote, there are not too many sexting matters that are coming to police attention, and certainly of any of the juvenile matters that are coming to our attention, they are not being charged. And here's the kicker. The report itself said, quote, The committee is not aware of any cases in Australia where a person who has been involved in consensual sexting has been prosecuted. The reality is, police simply don't lay charges in these situations, and even if they did, a public prosecutor has the ability to drop those charges. And even if that doesn't happen, and the matter proceeds to court, the judge has a variety of options to avoid a guilty verdict and a recorded conviction. For example, diversion programs like ropes. The judge also has discretion over placement of minors on the sex offenders register. So it's obvious that the so-called problem of underage teens being prosecuted for sexting never existed and was never even close to existing. Nevertheless, in 2014, the politicians legalized child porn for children in order to fix this non-existent problem. And they went way beyond just legalizing it for boyfriend-girlfriend sexting. Victoria Police even suggested a more restrictive regime that would only allow the images to be legally possessed by a more limited group of people directly associated with the images. But that suggestion was knocked back by the committee who repeatedly stated that they wanted to make the child porn legal for third parties and beyond, hence allowing the images to be readily disseminated more broadly. Also, on the issue of consent in relation to all of this, according to sections 40 and 41 of the Summary Offences Act, it is irrelevant whether or not the children depicted in the pornographic image consent to the distribution of the image, so the distribution can't be made illegal in that way. That is actually inconsistent with the age of consent laws for sexual intercourse, where children as young as 12 are said to be capable of consent. So it's as if these laws are designed to spread child porn as widely as possible. What we have here, in fact, is a kind of de facto legalized child porn industry, including the legal ability to procure labor, to manufacture, to distribute, and to possess and consume. A child can now legally have collections of child porn of many other children on their smartphones, computers, and thumb drives, or indeed in printed form, as long as they simply believe the children in the images and videos aren't more than two years younger than themselves and are engaging in legal sexual acts. This 
is a 2017 research article from the University of Melbourne on child sexual abuse. It says 50% of all child sexual abuse is perpetrated by other children and that pornography is a major driver of that abuse. Exposure to adult pornography is already ubiquitous among children. But instead of correcting that problem, politicians are creating a situation where exposure to child pornography will also become ubiquitous among children. Not only will that increase child-on-child -child sexual abuse, not only will it be a legalized factory for creating more child pornography and putting it into circulation, but it will, I believe, mean that some of these children get a taste for child porn which continues into their 20s and 30s and the rest of their adulthood. If that's the case, then this law is a factory for creating pedophiles. You might think your kids aren't at risk because they know nothing about this. Well, think again. Because I have evidence that your children are being told directly that they, quote, have the right to produce and distribute images of themselves that are sexually explicit. This is Vanessa Hamilton. She's a travelling sex educator who's been hired by many schools all around Victoria and some in New South Wales with the support of government. She not only teaches high school but also primary school and even kindergarten. Hi everybody, it's Vanessa Hamilton here from Talking to Talk Sex and Health Education. I spoke to 120 uh, 10 year old 10 and 11 year olds yesterday, they were fantastic. Listen to her explain what she's teaching your children directly about producing and distributing sexually explicit images of themselves. Hi everyone, this is Vanessa Hamilton from Talking the Talk, Sex and Health Education. I'm going to show you the books in my collection. One for the girls, For Fox's Sake by Rowan Murray. I love this book. She tells it like it is, really easy to read. Things in here, for example, sexting. She talks around suggesting to the girls um, that uh, they have the right to take images of themselves if they want to. They have the right to send um, images uh, that are sexually explicit. The book she's using there is a book titled For Fox's Sake. If we go to the book's official website, we can see that the book is apparently designed for tweens and teenagers and provides advice on things like BDSM, anal sex and making homemade porn. If we switch over to Google, we see that a tween is apparently a child between the ages of 10 and 14. Who was responsible for passing this? Given that the Victorian Labor Party under Daniel Andrews has a well-known commitment to perverting children, with programs like safe schools and so-called respectful relationships, we would expect legislation like this to come from them. But they weren't in government in October 2014 when the legislation was passed. They certainly supported the legislation and allowed it to sail through Parliament, but the legislation was initiated and driven by the then Victorian Liberal government. Here are some of the people who were part of that government. Michael O'Brien was then Treasurer, he is now Leader. Robert Clark was then Attorney General. He is now president of the Victorian Liberal Party. Matthew Guy was then planning minister before he attained the Liberal leadership following Labor's win at the November 2014 state election. And Daniel Andrews, the current premier, was opposition leader at the time. He allowed the law to be passed without opposition and has of course kept it in place as premier. Now there are federal laws against child pornography when it involves transmission over the internet or a telecommunications network because the federal government has jurisdiction in that area. Those laws are in the Criminal Code Act. They could have partially compensated for the weakening of the Victorian laws. However, when the Victorian government passed those laws, as you can see here, it adopted a policy of not prosecuting federal child pornography offences, where an accused person would have a valid defence to child pornography charges under the Victorian legislation. This is a problem because the federal government usually relies on state police and public prosecutors to pursue such cases. No doubt it's also in the works to weaken federal child pornography laws and those in other states. Indeed, it already seems to have happened in New South Wales. 
On the 20th of June 2018, the New South Wales Parliament passed the Criminal Legislation Amendment Child Sexual Abuse Act 2018. This legislation was somewhat different to the Victorian legislation in that it simply legalises possession of any child pornography for persons under 18 years of age in situations where a, quote, reasonable person would consider it acceptable. The problem is, of course, who decides what a reasonable person would think? Is it a judge or a public prosecutor alone? If police are trying to prosecute cases where juveniles, for example, possess large collections of child porn on their phones or computers, but judges or public prosecutors are repeatedly throwing out these cases upon judging that a reasonable person, according to them, wouldn't have a problem with it, will the police stop bothering to investigate those cases and stop bothering to make arrests? The legislation also allowed a defence to production and dissemination of child pornography if the accused person is the only person in the material who is depicted in a pornographic way. Again, this was a change made by a Liberal government, with the support of the Labour opposition. Also, the changes were buried in a bill that contained many seemingly good changes which is another common deception tactic used by politicians. Why were these changes really made? Given what we've seen in the UK, it's tempting to blame pedophile networks for this sort of thing. But I actually don't think that pedophile networks are the primary driving force behind this. I think the driving motivation behind this and so many other government programs that sexualize children is ideological. Ideologues who oppose the traditional nuclear family unit as the norm of society don't want your children to have a healthy sexual development. The sexual preferences and behaviours of adults are often shaped by their experiences in their formative childhood years. Sustained exposure to pornography and sexual activity during the formative childhood years means a lesser likelihood that they'll be able to form a stable, long-term marital relationship in their adulthood. And that is precisely what is intended by the ideologues pushing this agenda. You destroy the family, and you destroy the country.